Blair and Bush say war strategy is right and will succeed. Back in the skies, Concord goes back to work. Asylum seekers force cut back in Channel Tunnel trains. And England football stars sent home in disgrace. From ITN, the IT. TV News with Katie Darrell. Good evening. The Prime Minister and President Bush stood side by side at the White House tonight, a month on from the start of the war against terrorism. And they promised that it would succeed no matter how long it took. Mr. Blair said his determination to see justice done was as strong today as it was on September the 11th. Mr. Bush agreed. But it would take a while, he said. It's not one of those Kodak moments. From Washington, James Mates reports. Back in Washington for the second time in six weeks, the Prime Minister stepping off Concord with little fanfare or ceremony for what will be just a few hours with President Bush. The two men already speak several times a week by phone, but as he walked into the White House this evening, there remains plenty to discuss, not least Tony Blair's recent trip to the Middle East and the view from there of how the coalition's holding together. That the two men get on well is no secret, Blair going out of his way to praise the president on US TV last night. I think he's performed uh, magnificently during this crisis, and it's really tough. It's, it requires real qualities of leadership, and I believe he's shown them. At a joint press conference less than an hour ago, the president was similarly effusive. He's facing some unhappiness here with the pace of the war, and he again reiterated the need for patience. That is not one of these Kodak moments. There's no moment to this. This is a long struggle in a different kind of war. But we're patient and our close friends are patient, uh, which is bad news for the Taliban and, and the people they harbor. As they took questions, the two leaders were clearly on first name terms. Are you going to go with that, George, or what? Yeah. Tony Blair making the clearest statement yet of his war aims. It's Al-Qaeda and the terrorist network shut down. It's the Taliban regime out. It's a new regime in that is broad-based. Now, I think those are pretty clear objectives, and I have absolutely no doubt at all that we will achieve them in full, and we will not let up until we do. Thank he you flies all. home tonight to be back in London for meetings with Middle Eastern leaders tomorrow, keeping the coalition together, proving to be a pretty full-time job. James Mates, ITN, Washington. James, what do you think Mr. Blair's visit uh, tells us about the state of the coalition? Well, both of them are saying for public consumption that the coalition remains in extremely good shape. Tony Blair is saying just this evening, I believe the coalition is stronger now than it's ever been. He also said he was able to tell the president that from his talks with European leaders, there are absolutely uh, no problems on that front, that Europe is right behind him. Uh, but behind the scenes, they will be worried about the sort of reception and the sort of problems Tony Blair had in the Middle East last week. Uh, they both know that holding these big coalitions together takes a lot of work. Uh, many in Bush's cabinet know that because they were involved in the coalition uh, that fought the Gulf, Gulf War. Uh, so I think we may see quite a lot more of this high-speed shuttle diplomacy as this war goes on. And are the American people appreciating Mr. Blair's support? Yes, I think they are, both at a government level, uh, talking to officials and also talking to ordinary Americans. Uh, the Americans would be doing exactly the same thing on their own if they had to, make no mistake about that. But they do recognize that, that it will go much better if they have help, and they greatly appreciate the sort of public face that uh, Tony Blair has given to that. James Mates, thank you. The Arab television station Al Jazeera has shown pictures of boys it claims are two young sons of Osama bin Laden somewhere in Afghanistan holding guns and talking defiantly about the airstrikes on the country. As Mark Austin reports, those attacks continue today and more of the huge daisy cutter bombs were dropped. Picking over the debris of what the Taliban say is a downed American helicopter, two children who the Arabic television channel Al Jazeera said this evening are the sons of Osama bin Laden. The pictures, it's claimed, were taken inside Afghanistan and complete with defiant statements are clearly designed to taunt the West. Bizarre images from a war which seems to be intensifying. Once again today, more bombing runs against Taliban front lines, all designed to kill troops and destroy morale. On this front line, north of Kabul, these anti-Taliban forces still watch and wait. But similar bombing in the north is apparently helping opposition forces advance on the strategic city of Mazar.
Dari Sharif. The heavy bombing by United States B-52 bombers and other aircraft is clearly weakening the Taliban front lines and providing opportunities for the Northern Alliance to break through. If and when Mazari Sharif does fall, it's highly likely British ground forces will assist the Americans in launching both military and humanitarian operations from Mazar. But these are early days. The Americans hope this Vietnam era bomb will help accelerate a Northern Alliance ground offensive. The so-called daisy cutter is so big it has to be carried by a transport plane. It's dropped out of the back of the aircraft on a parachute. The bomb is the size of a car and weighs 15,000 pounds. At its tip is a four-foot rod. When this hits the ground, it ignites a cocktail of explosive and polystyrene slurry. This sends out an enormous blast wave which sucks up oxygen and incinerates everything in its path for 600 yards. In the Gulf War, for example, it was um, deployed and used, and when the Iraqis saw it, they instantly, uh, or, or at least uh, near instantaneously, decided to, uh, to, to quit the front line and surrender. This is how some Northern Alliance troops are fighting this war, and today it emerged the Americans are not only supplying the fighters with weapons and ammunition, but they're also providing food for the horses. Mark Austin, ITN. There was confirmation today of just how badly Britain's tourism industry has been affected by the terrorist attacks on America. Official figures showed the number of Americans visiting Britain fell by 17% in September. U.S. visitors account for a fifth of all tourist spending, and there are predictions that even fewer may visit in the future. Well, we saw Mr. Blair earlier in the program arriving in America on the second BA Concorde flight of the day, but it was their earlier one which attracted the real fanfare. It carried the first fare-paying passengers since that terrible crash in Paris, and BA's hopes of stemming the company's huge losses. Nicholas Owen was on board. Noisy, old-fashioned, but still the most spectacular aircraft around. Concorde roared back into regular operation this morning, lifting off from Heathrow, bound for New York. Sixteen months after the Paris disaster, which has meant much modification before the plane was allowed back into the sky. On board, 90 invited guests, many the sort of high-powered business customers British Airways sorely needs. The combination of the Paris accident and the terrorist attacks in America have hit transatlantic travel hard. It was great to see British Airways engineers waving us off. It was wonderful to hear the good wishes from air traffic control and other pilots. And even as we roared down the runway, an American pilot called Go Concord Go. At twice the speed of sound, the vintage champagne flowed. The musician Sting is a Concord regular. Very nice to be back on a plane. I've used it for 20 years. It's, uh, it's kind of emotional. It's, it's nice to get to New York before you've left. The media was able to sample the supersonic facilities, though the cutlery now has to be plastic to conform with new safety rules. This is the big selling point, of course, the speed. The indicator here is showing that we're at Mach 2 now. That's about 1,400 miles an hour. Things could hardly be tougher for British Airways at the moment, as yesterday's dire financial results proved. It hopes that this performance will help it to keep and attract the sort of traveller who's willing to pay just under £7,000 for a return to New York. And after flying for just over three hours and 20 minutes, Concorde reached New York. How are you? How are you Good to meet you. On to the plane to greet everyone, the city's now legendary mayor, Rudolf Giuliani. Uh, we, we want to make certain that we invite all of you to really enjoy New York City, and I have to ask you to do one very special favor for me while you're here. Spend a lot of money. <laughs> Francis Concorde is back in service too, their first reaching America, an hour ahead of British Airways Flight 001. Nicholas Owen, ITN, New York. The Transport Secretary Stephen Byers was accused of lying again tonight over the collapse of rail track, this time by the Conservatives. They say evidence from the rail regulator, Tom Windsor, today contradicts what Mr Byers told MPs on Monday, and they say it's time for him to go. Here's John Ray. The Transport Secretary is under fresh and intense pressure tonight after his version of the rail track affair was again called into question. Mr Byers pulled the plug on the company last month, saying it was bankrupt, but now the rail regulators revealed he could have tried to find other sources of cash, but was warned off with talk of emergency legislation. After pausing to consider whether I had really heard what I had just heard, I asked whether that would be to overrule me in an interim review 
or in relation to all my functions. Mr. Byers said that it would cover everything, but its first use would be in relation to an interim review, which the government did not want to proceed. But that seems at odds with what Mr. Byers told MPs on Monday. In terms of threats, there was no threat in terms of the use of the regulator or denying the regulator his position. Mr. Byers has already clashed publicly with the rail track chairman, John Robinson, over the company's Minister, collapse. But tonight he is insisting no threats were ever made to the regulator and by implication that the House of Commons has not been misled. For all that, the Tories sent blood. His intent from the beginning was to wind up the company, to pull the plug on it. He's been caught out yet again, saying one thing to Parliament, and, and the reality has been quite different. Frankly, his position is untenable. Tonight, Downing Street is again giving Mr Byers, the Prime Minister's, full support. But with two inquiries now running into rail track, this is by no means the end of the line. John Ray, ITN, at the Department of Transport. The new look House of Lords was outlined by the government today and straight away met with some traditional political hostility. The Conservatives called the plans shabby and inadequate. There'll be 600 members of the new chamber. This is where they'll come from. 120 members will be elected. Another 120 will be appointed by an independent panel and won't be aligned with any party. But almost all the rest, around 330, will be nominated by political parties and there'll be no more hereditary peerages. Rail freight journeys through the Channel Tunnel were reduced by two-thirds today because of the problems created by asylum seekers trying to get on board. During one 24-hour period at the start of the week, 74 asylum seekers were found in wagons that had arrived in Folkestone. And ITV News has its own evidence of asylum seekers arriving last night, as Joyce Ahaja reports. Sit down. Sit down there. You in England? Afghan? Afghan? No On their routine security check at the freight yard near Folkestone, guards find six illegal immigrants hiding in wagons overnight. The trains have just come through the Channel Tunnel. It's a constant flow. Earlier this week, 74 asylum seekers arrived in Britain on board three freight trains. French officials have been criticised because these trains should have been checked in France. The French National Railway Service, SNCF, told us they're taking action and they're reducing the number of trains that run along these tracks by up to two-thirds. They say they're worried about the security and the number of asylum seekers that are getting through. Security concerns were heightened after these ITV pictures showed refugees storming the tunnel in Calais. The road haulage associations worried the problem will move from the railways to the roads. This is a political problem that's long overdue and even tackled. Uh, it's been going on for a few years now. We've been arguing and arguing with the government to do something about it. Maybe now, at, at long last, the French are waking up to the problem. SNCF haven't said how long the reduction in service will last, and it's unclear how effective the move will be in cutting down the number of stowaways. Joyce O'Haja, ITN, near Folkestone. There was a dramatic police chase through the streets of Dallas in Texas today, and it was all captured on camera. It started when a man made off with a lorry carrying tons of timber and a forklift truck. Helicopters from local TV stations followed the action as the burning lorry careered through the streets of the city. Other drivers had to be careful as planks of wood fell off the back. Despite this, the thief managed to keep control. In the end, he gave himself up and was taken into custody. Now, just when things were looking good for Newcastle United, currently fourth in the Premiership, there's been a big falling out between the club and four of its players. England international Kieran Dyer and three teammates were sent home in disgrace from a training camp in Marbella. So far, the club hasn't said what they did wrong. Here's our sports correspondent, Felicity Barr. England star Kieran Dyer is the most high profile of the four players sent home from Spain for what Newcastle describe as a breach of disciplinary rules. Dyer and current goal-scoring hero Craig Bellamy, along with Andy Griffin and Carl Court, apparently failed to attend an official dinner, but the club won't elaborate on their misdemeanours. The players were under instructions to go to the dinner, and uh, these four didn't. I mean, people are asking the question, if they weren't at the dinner, were, where were they? But I, I don't think that's an issue. Dyer, who's been out injured this season, was also warned about his off-the-field activities last year. But although England coach Sven Euron Eriksson is a strict disciplinarian, he says Dyer shouldn't be worried about his international future. We all do mistakes now and then. 
and I don't about Tyre. I have no idea what happened there, so I don't want to talk about that. But uh, in general, we all do mistakes now and then. Doesn't mean that we should be killed forever. Uh, life is not like that. As well as being sent home, the players have also been fined, and Newcastle say, as far as they're concerned, the matter's closed. Felicity Barr, ITN Sport. Tonight's headlines, the Prime Minister and President Bush said tonight they were determined that the war on terrorism would succeed no matter how long it took. The two men have been having talks at the White House. And Concord has made its first passenger flight since the Paris crash over a year ago. It arrived in New York to be welcomed by Mayor Rudolf Giuliani. And that's the ITV News tonight from me and all the team here. Goodbye. Winter is finally here for tomorrow, so that means frequent snow showers in particular across the northeast of Scotland and England. So for tonight, snowy showers across Scotland, further south, rain turning into sleet, a very cold night in hand, down to freezing point in some parts of those Scottish glens. Tomorrow, we're going to have some hefty snow showers across the north and down the eastern side of the UK. By the end of the day, a couple of centimetres of snow in particular across higher ground. Further west looks like a largely dry with some sunshine, but for Wales, and Northern Ireland we're going to get some wintry showers a very cold day with that as well temperatures nothing really to write home about five across Aberdeen with a very very strong northerly wind to recap tomorrow wintry and extremely cold bye bye for now power gen bringing the essentials to life